Test, test. Yeah, there we go. Test, test. Hello? Okay. Okay. I should be expecting questions on, on my schedule, right? Right, I mean, but 10 minutes is the 10 minutes of the 40, not 10 minutes of the 30. Okay, and at 30 minutes, you'll show me the 10 minutes sign. Okay, yeah. 10 minutes and 5 minutes and I'll try. Okay. Where's my scarf? Just, just, you can just say Bob. Welcome everyone. <laughs> and here's a free posters for you if you want. And uh, please, when you come uh, during the presentation, please close the door as quietly as possible. Uh, if you want, evaluate decisions on this link. And uh, please tweet about this conference. Please close the door about the conference and please write a blog posts about the conference and I should promote a grand finale today at the 16.30 at the D105 you can win some great things and now please welcome new presenter uh, Robert Relia and his presentation about quantum krypton thing Hello, I'm uh, Bob Relia, and I work in the security group uh, in Red Hat Mountain View. And I'm going to talk about what we're going to do when the uh, quantum uh, computer apocalypse hits on us. <clears throat> so what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to explain some uh, quantum computer basics. We're going to explain how quantum computers can attack crypto systems. Then we're going to talk about the current state of quantum computers. Then I'm going to survey those algorithms that will survive. We're calling those the post-quantum crypto algorithms. So they're not 
They don't run on com uh, quantum computers, they run on a regular computer. Um, what I'm not going to talk about is I'm not going to get into the math behind quantum computer uh, cryptos and how, how it does the attacks. Um, and I'm not going to go into enough detail on these uh, post-quantum crypto algorithms that you'll be able to implement them, but only just a basic overview. Okay, so quantum computers uh, basically use uh, entangled elementary particles to solve brute force mathematical problems pretty much instantly. It uses the laws of uh, quantum uh, physics to be able to try all the possible uh, uh, solutions to a problem basically at once. Um, if there's more than one solution to the problem, then the quantum uh, uh, rules will say the probabilities of which answers will be uh, uh, returned, and it could return different answers on different runs. Uh, but crypto problems basically have unique solutions, and therefore they're actually uh, perfectly targeted, uh, quantum computers perfectly targeted for solving crypto problems. But quantum computers do have some limits. Uh, quantum computers are based on gates. They aren't based on running a program like we're, we're used to. So, for instance, there's not loops or iterations in the quantum computer. You, couldn't, you can't build a quantum computer to do AES and then uh, drop the quantum input in. So they can't be used directly against our crypto algorithms. Instead, there are additional algorithms that can then be used to attack our, uh, our actual uh, crypto algorithms. Uh, quantum computers are also all or nothing. Um, if you have a, an 8-bit quantum computer, you can't get a little bit of uh, uh, advantage in trying to break a large key. Um, you need to have the full bit size uh, bit in order to be able to get the advantage of being able to try all those uh, combinations. <clears throat> so quantum computers can, can break our crypto systems. Um, our public key systems are particularly vulnerable. There is a quantum algorithm called quantum Fourier transform, and that can be used to solve the hidden subgroup problem. These labels are, are uh, sort of important because the hidden subgroup problem is the underlying problem that's actually common between RSA, DH, DSA, and ECC. You, we, you may not realize, but these were actually all have, all underneath the covers can be reduced to this particular problem. That means quantum computers can break completely those algorithms. Um, the QFT requires more QU bits than the key attack, so the size of quantum computer will have to be bigger than, uh, than the actual key sizes for these algorithms. But once that happens, um, uh, the algorithm is completely broken. There's a, another quantum algorithm called uh, Grover's algorithm. This also uses QFT, and it solves the generalized search problem. That is, given some function, given an input to that function, um, and, or given, given the output of that function, uh, find the input that produced that output. Um, that's basically our hash functions and symmetric uh, uh, algorithms. Fortunately, Grover's algorithm doesn't completely break them. It just reduces their, their strength. So we'll have to double the key sizes to get the same strength that we, we had before. But the algorithms themselves aren't broken. <clears throat> OK, so what have quantum computers actually been able to, what have they been able to de demonstrate to date? And it's really not that impressive. Um, um, we can factor numbers that are trivial to factor uh, normally. Uh, where it says Shor algorithm, Shor is a special case of the uh, quantum uh, uh, Fourier transform. Um, the interesting things are these last two here, where, uh, where the sizes are starting to get large. And the algorithm isn't QFT, but a minimization function. And I'm going to talk about that a little later in, in the talk. Um, Google's been using quantum computers and recently um, has published a paper on how they are getting actual uh, speed ups on, by using the quantum computers, that it's not just running classically. Just this week during, during the talk, the NSA has uh, uh, published a paper um, 
basically is a call to action saying that we need to start looking at uh, replacing our algorithms uh, to ensure quantum computers don't break them. Um, Tor has also been interested in uh, quantum computers, um, or in the uh, dangers of quantum computers, and they are moving towards using uh, one of the post-quantum uh, algorithms in their network. They're worried about people recording the sessions and then waiting for quantum computers to come along to be able to break those sessions. Okay, so are we in immediate trouble? Well, researchers can factor a 16-bit number in something as small as four QU bits of a, a quantum computer, which is a pretty, pretty small. Um, on the other hand, this is a special case. That particular number only, uh, the factors only differ by two bits, and we knew they differed by two bits. Um, uh, the, the big question here is will we be able to expand that particular attack to uh, more, the more generalized case of uh, the RSA keys? Uh, D-Wave builds a commercial quantum computer that's quite large, uh, 1,000 QU bits. Um, but it's a very special purpose one. It cannot do QFT. It's not a general purpose um, uh, quantum computer. It can only solve the minimization problem. On the other hand, minimization problem is exactly that problem that, uh, that we used above to solve... Uh, uh, the 16-bit number. So it is something we still need to look at. Uh, as I mentioned before, Google announced that they are getting uh, speed-ups from their quantum computers. Uh, they have a D-Wave computer. But their uh, speed-ups are only 2 to the 8th, not 2 to the uh, uh, 100,000. So there's still some coherence uh, issues in those large quantum computers where you're not getting the full benefit of all those quantum bits. Researchers expect uh, uh, QFTs within the next 10 years. It's probably um, uh, optimistic. Uh, we might actually see it sooner. Optimistic meaning we hope it's longer because we want our crypto systems to last longer. Um, but people who secure data for a long time already need to start worrying about this. Uh, this is why you see both the NSA and TOR, two organizations that couldn't be more different from each other, worried about the same problem. Uh, the last thing is small key sizes, that is ECC, are likely to fall first. Okay, so what are these new algorithms that, that are out there? They're not really new, but what are those algorithms out there that uh, uh, will survive quantum crypto that we can replace our public key systems with? So the first one I will explain a little more uh, completely because it's actually quite simple. It's called hash-based based encryption. And it works uh, on a fairly simple principle that you can't reverse a hash. So create a public key. You pick the size of thing you want to sign. So usually that's the hash output of the hash function from the, the signing operation. And you create a vector of... Uh, a bunch of random numbers that you generate. Those random numbers, one represents a zero bit, one represents a one bit, and then you have one for every bit in the, um, uh, in the thing that you want to sign. And then the size of those are uh, the, the base hash function you're using for signing. Then you hash those and produce your public key. So the public key is the hash of those secret values that you generated on the fly. Then to sign something, you simply publish the, uh, that uh, pub uh, private value that you had for each of the bits in the, the signature. So for bit one, if it's one, you, you publish x1 of zero, and if it's uh, zero, you publish, or x, x1 of one, and if it's zero, you publish x1 of zero. And you do that for each of those bits. And in the verify, all you have, uh, the verifier, all he has to do is walk through and hash what you've produced and make sure it matches the corresponding bits in that public key. Now, there is, there is a fairly obvious limitation here. I've just published half of my uh, private key. 
That means if I try to sign again, I'm going to publish more of it, and now the, the private key is out and people can use it. So this is a one-time signature. Once you've used the uh, private uh, public key, you can't use it again. This is pretty much a, a very strong limitation in being able to use it in our crypto systems. But this has been around since 1975, so we invented Merkle trees exactly to solve this problem. So what you do with the Merkle tree is you generate 2 to the n, where n is uh, like 32 bits. So you have 2 to the n signing operations you can do on this key now. So you have one for each, each time you want to sign. You go ahead and generate all your uh, private keys and then build, uh, build the, the public keys from them. And then you hash all the public keys. Um, and so you have a hash for each of those public keys. And then they come up, and you take to each pair and hash them again to the next node. And then you hash each node to the next node. And you continue to do that until you get a single node at the top. That uh, top node becomes your public key. And then when you sign something, you go ahead and publish your signature. And you publish the actual public key for that signature and you publish the hash of the one next to it, and up the chain. So if you use 2 to the 32, there'll be uh, 30 of these things, um, plus the public key. Um, and then the verifier can build all the ha reconstruct all the hashes and verify that it matches your top hash, so he knows that that public key fit this infrastructure. And if you generate your private keys from a, with using a PRNG with a specific seed, you can keep that seed and regenerate them. So with very little storage, you, can act, you actually can get two, two to the 32 or 64 or however many you wanna, uh, of these you want to generate signing operations uh, on that key. So uh, hash-based encryptions. Um, the key sizes are large. Uh, for uh, SHA-256, uh, the key size is roughly, six, uh, not roughly, exactly 16 uh, kilobytes. And it's single use. If you use Merkle-based, the uh, uh, public key is much smaller, but the signatures are uh, still 2 to the 16 uh, plus a little bit more. or I mean, six, uh, 16 kilobytes plus a little bit more. And then the signing operation is fairly expensive because you've got to regenerate that whole tree again. Or you have to store that whole tree, then it's expensive in storage and not in CPU. Um, this is only a signing algorithm. It does not give you key exchange. Uh, but it's not patent encumbered. OK, code-based uh, crypto. Uh, the idea of code-based crypto is to use um, error correction systems. To, uh, to be able to do some encryption. So you pick a matrix that introduces some error correction code into a vector, and then you create a, a function that will correct any errors uh, that come, come back based on that matrix. You pick uh, some invertible matrices, uh, S and P, to scramble the bits in, in G so that the, uh, so the attacker can't actually generate DG himself. And in your public key, is simply the matrix multiply of all those matrices. Um, and your private key is the inverse of those matrices you use plus the uh, uh, error correction function. And then to encrypt, you take your message, multiply it by the uh, um, error, uh, uh, error correction matrix, and then add some error to it. And that's your, your uh, ciphertext. And then to decrypt, you simply uh, pull out P and then run it through your, uh, uh, your error correction code and recorrect, recorrect the error that you introduced, or remove the error that you introduced, and then remove the uh, um, rest of the matrix to get, uh, to get your message. OK. Uh, the scheme, the original scheme uh, that was proposed in 1975 used uh, GOPA uh, or GAPA uh, correction error codes 
and they seem secure. Uh, other ERP codes have been used with this system, and they have been broken. Um, this provides encryption, so you can do it for key exchange. Um, a signing system that was originally introduced was actually broken. There's a new signing system that was introduced in 2001, which seems secure. The key sizes are fairly large. So for 61 bits of what we can currently call 61 bits of strength, it takes 72 kilobytes for the public key. Um, the encryption is not patent encumbered because it was published in 1975. I do not know whether or not there's patents covering the signing. Lattice space. <clears throat> this is one that's got a fair amount of interest because uh, one of the algorithms that has actually been implemented and used is a lattice space function. Um, lattices are, are uniform sets of points in space and in dimensional space. And they're generated from a set of vectors called the base. And there's two hard problems in, in, in lattice space. One is finding the smallest vector that's in the lattice. And the other one is finding the uh, distance between arbitrary, uh, an arbitrary vector that's not in the lattice with a vector that's in the lattice. Um, some bases make these, just like you would expect, some bases is make uh, these hard problems actually easy, and these are called easy bases. Others make it difficult, and to transfer from one base to another is a well-known problem in, in the lattice space, and they're considered equivalent lattices. Um, so your public key, your private key becomes the easy base, your public key becomes a hard base, and then there's a number of proposals for how you make these problems uh, turn into a crypt crypto system. Um, I won't go through the specifics of any of them, but uh, here's some of the, the three-lettered acronyms for, for the different systems. The original one that was proposed for Lattice, the GGH, uh, is the simplest, but it's already been broken. NTrue is the one that uh, actually, there's actually standards on this. There's implementations. It's being used today on the, on the web. It appears to be uh, practical. It has key sizes about the same as RSA. Um, but it doesn't have any security proofs. Um, and it is patent encumbered. Um, L uh, LWE has provable security, but it has megabyte size key, uh, key sizes. Uh, Lattice space has been around initially since uh, the end of the 20th century. Um, it supports both encryption and signing. And uh, there's still research needed to, to get confidence that lattice-based uh, systems are actually quantum safe, or even uh, safe for, uh, against classical attacks as well. So like GGH has been broken from a, a classical sense. Um, Multivariant based crypto. Uh, this, these are based on the hardness of solving nonlinear equations in finite fields. So your public key, Px, is a set of quadratic equations, and it's constructed from a bunch of mapping functions. Your private key is those mapping functions that were used to construct P of x. Your encryption is you pass your message in to your set of quadratics, and out comes uh, uh, crypto text. Uh, to decrypt, you uh, in, apply the inverse of those mapping functions to C, and you wind up with M. Now, there's several schemes proposed how these mapping functions work and the parameters for that. Um, key sizes uh, vary. Uh, the smallest uh, for an 80-bit uh, key strength is 22 kilobytes. These were also, have also uh, been proposed since the end of the 20th century. They support both signing and encryption. And they also need more research uh, to have confidence whether or not uh, these systems really are secure. So in conclusion, quantum computers are looking uh, more real every day. Our traditional uh, ciphers look like, uh, tr traditional public key ciphers look like they're ready to fall. The high bit, uh, bit size RSA, DSA, and DH will hold off quantum computers before ECC because the quantum computers have to get to the size to be able to factor those large, um, large numbers. 
the caveat is uh, if we ever get direct factoring algorithms from uh, quantum computers using minimization, RSA may become vulnerable soon. Um, so hold off on your rapid conversion to ECC that we told you to do two years ago. <laughs> or I told you to do two years ago in, in my talk, uh, two years ago. And uh, if you're in crypto, you need to start studying lattice, multivariant uh, quadratics, and air code systems. Um, we also need to start looking at our protocols. It looks like we're going to have to start handling these very large key sizes um, in, our, in our protocols uh, if we're going to get through this in, in uh, a soon period, especially since the systems that look like they will hold, uh, that we don't need more research on, are all basically large key size systems. Um, and that's it. Feedback uh, is on here. And I'm open for questions now. Yes? On what? That's right. Uh, the reason. The reason they went back on Sweet I'm sorry. Uh, recently, the NSA went back on uh, their uh, Sweet B uh, recommendations. And the reason for that is exactly here. They're expecting ECC to fall because ECC has smaller bit sizes. So the first quantum computers that will likely break a crypto system will be a smaller one that will break ECC, not one that will break RSA or uh, ECDSA. So what they've recommended is hold off on implementing ECC continue to use RSA and DSA and crank up those bit sizes as much as possible. Because the larger the bit size, the longer it takes before we have a quantum computer that has enough bits to be able to break the larger bit sizes. There are no, uh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, the uh, question is, uh, are there any uh, uh, current uh, moves to standardize uh, systems with these larger key sizes? And the answer is, there currently isn't. It's something I think people have now sort of gotten flat-footed on. But I would expect to see in the next year people will start having proposals. Um, and I think some of the people in this room should probably be driving some of those proposals. Uh, yes, Steve? Okay, thanks. Um, I was going to say that, you know, I was speaking to the technical director of the uh, cryptographic module validation program, and he said that they're going to move to 4096, uh, 8192, and 16440 sized keys in the very near future, you know, to, to put this off. So we'll probably be seeing that in the next round of uh, standards coming out of NIST. Yeah, um, yeah Simo? Is there any quantum-based crypto that is being also explored to use the quantum math? Um, there, there is quantum-based uh, schemes, um, but those schemes um, obviously require quantum computers. Um, and they don't really have key exchanges. What your key is is a uh, quantum particle that you've, uh, that you've exchanged back and forth. We're not looking at that. Um, to, to solve these problems because quantum computers are going to be available before they're going to be generally available to, to people. So we need to be able to live through that period. So, uh, yeah. Okay, well, thank you for your presentation. Uh, if I got uh, some point correctly, you said that uh, to the, the quantum computer to be successful, it needs to have a lot of uh, Qubits. I'm sorry. What was the question? Um, the quantum computer to be successful to decrypt something, uh, it it needs to have a lot of qubits. Yes, it needs to have a number of qubits in order to solve it. So it's going to need the the first one that breaks something like uh, EC uh, 256 is going to be, need to be bigger than 250 uh, than yeah, 256 because the QFT requires something larger than what you're actually 
you're actually attacking. So my question would be uh, how uh, difficult enough uh, qubits like would it be question of uh, uh, money or technology or so uh, we can we can go we can only go by what sort of the people in research are saying they're, they're they're having problems as you get more and more qubits to trying to keep the air and trying to keep them coherent and you can see that with the D wave even though they have a thousand qubits um, in a non general purpose they're not able to use that whole thousand qubits uh, in their system. Uh, otherwise, Google would getting, be getting much larger um, uh, speed ups than they're actually seeing. And so um, it's not known how long it's going to take. Uh, you saw the quantum computers that actually did work are all very, very small. They're uh, eight QU bits uh, for something general. Um, Steve was just telling me the other day that. Uh, um, that some people have actually generated a quantum, some quantum gates, and once those start coming in, into place, we might start seeing more of these and actually see things built to, to do uh, generalized uh, QFT. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Paul. So you didn't really mention uh, symmetric algorithms and how they are vulnerable or not vulnerable to quantum computers. Oh, uh, uh, there was a very quick slide on symmetric. Symmetric is going to, uh, uh, the effect on symmetric is the same as the effect on hashes, which is we have to double our key sizes because the Grover algorithm is a general case algorithm. It doesn't really matter what the underlying crypto is. Um, it's a generalized search algorithm, and it can actually uh, come up and be able to come out with output based on, uh, on input in a much quicker way than we used to be able to do. With, um, uh, with our normal search algorithms. So it's going to be really great if you're a database search thing because your speed ups will, will be amazing, but it also means that our crypto systems are inherently going to use, need to use twice as, much bit, twice as many bits to be just as secure as they used to be. You mentioned you're not looking at quantum-based distribution uh, systems. Uh, but the quantum tele telecommunications uh, research is moving actually at, at an even faster pace than the quantum computing itself. There are even uh, commercially available solutions already from companies like Quantique for the uh, private keys distribution where you use the quantum entanglement uh, and the statistics associated with it to uh, detect eavesdropping. So you could if essentially guarantee the private nature of those distributed keys. Why is this not being looked into? I, it's because the systems that we're trying to secure don't fit that model. Um, we're talking about what happens when you encrypt on your disk, what happens in a normal person, and it also we need to have these algorithms running today uh, because these quantum, because uh, the data that we're trying to secure we want to be secure 10 years from now when quantum computers come out. So we basically need systems that run on classical, classical systems. Quantum encryption is interesting, and I'm sure we'll have to uh, add it to, to some of our systems. But, back, but the fact is we're still working on classical computers and will be for quite some time. And we need systems that run on classical computers and are safe for, uh, for, against quantum computers. Hello, uh, I have a question. There is an uh, encryption technique called one-time path, and it basically says that you generate random data and XOR it with your message. Uh, the only problem is the distribution of the keys. Uh, is this vulnerable to quantum computers or not? I think it's not, but... Uh, one-time like... one -time pads are one of those rare cases where if it really is a one-time pad, it's provably secure because uh, there is no way of determining what the, the key bits are. They're, they're, you, can, uh, you can pick any ciphertext you want and find a set of uh, bits that will produce that ciphertext output. Therefore, there's no way to actually attack a a truly one-time pad. The problem is one-time pads are notoriously difficult, and we don't actually implement them in any of our systems. So. 
Hello. Um, the idea is that we need more qubits than bits only in the case of QFT algorithm. Has it been proved that this is the bet best case ever or in general, is there the chance that any other algorithm will be able to be better than, than this? No, um, it has not been proved. And even worse, it's not been proved that these quantum safe algorithms are quantum safe. <laughs> There's, th that's, that's why we're talking about more, needing more research. Um, um, it's just that we don't, today don't know any quantum algorithms that can break these, the, the ones that we've, uh, we've given. Um, but if you look at the table of the kinds of things that have been break, broken by um, uh, quantum computers, things like lattice looks dangerous because they're in that set of everything around it's broken but not them. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the reason that the NSA isn't jumping on NTRU. The other problem is that NTRU is patent encumbered. They went that way with ECC and know what headaches that is. Um, but I think part of it is they're not sure that it's not that some tomorrow somebody's not going to publish a paper on how you can break in true with uh, with a quantum computer. So there are no proofs yet regarding these algorithms. There's there's security proofs, but there's no proofs that says that say the hard problem is not solvable on quantum computers. Mm -hmm. um, okay, thanks. There's no algorithm that has that. Uh, I think I'm over time, so this is the last one. Thomas? Okay, uh, this is not a question, but uh, uh, some kind of advertisement. Uh, if you want to see something uh, also interesting as uh, Bob's uh, presentation, uh, there was a very nice presentation on, on post-quantum crypto uh, in um, uh, Chaos Computer Congress uh, uh, 32C3. And it's recorded, and uh, by the, uh, it's a presentation by Daniel Bernstein uh, and Daniel Lang, and uh, they they uh, showed very nice, very nicely how, uh, for example, the hashing, uh, hashing, uh, hash trees work, and and so on. Okay, uh, thank you, everyone. If you have any more questions, you can grab me afterwards, or Steve. <laughs>
Testing, testing. Can everybody hear me?